if you uh, could maybe address the role of government spending, whether it's accretive or subtractive from GDP as it was in the first quarter and then moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It, it, it certainly a, a plays a role. But, I, you know, I, I, in my own thinking about this, I think that, that uh, you know, fiscal policy is going to play some amount of role in, in the shaping of, of my forecast. But, you know, we're talking about relatively small amounts of movement rel in terms of relative to the amounts of error that can creep in in terms of what's happening to the broader economy. Um, you know, so you know, those changes in government spending, I think, um, I, I, I think of that as being, as I was trying to describe, it's relatively small, those, that impact of that relative to the other sources of error in terms of the other shocks that might hit the economy. Uh, sir, uh, state legislators have not been able to come up with a budget compromise yet and we'll have to go into a special session and possibly a government shutdown. How detrimental is that to the state economy, and how does that impact the state economy if we go into a government shutdown? Yeah, I, I think uh, the direct impact in the state economy is relatively small um, in terms of you know, the outlook for the Minnesota economic forecast. If that event were to take place, which I'm not saying it will, but if that event were to take place, I think the ultimate, the uh, immediate impact Assuming it was for a relatively short period of time, um, would be relatively would be relatively small. Um, you know, there's a, a budget shortfall in Minnesota, and the elected officials in the state have to figure out a way to to uh, to, to deal with that. And I, you know, I I think it's important for the longer run health of the of the state that we get on and get into a better a, a good dialogue about how that how that takes place. But the immediate short run effect. Uh, I think would, uh, my forecast right now would be that would be relatively small. Thanks for coming to Rochester, Mr. Culture Dakota. Uh, my name is Mike. I live here in Rochester. And I was just about the recent financial crisis or just the economic crunch we went through, which was I'm 47 years old, and I hope we never see anything like that again. And so uh, I'm assuming it's it's a historic event. But I, I guess my questions for you are, did it represent a perfect storm of all these different things? You know, people taking more loans than they can afford, um, greedy people on Wall Street running with it. Um, so was it a perfect storm? Will it happen again? And I'm just curious about your perspective on the role of the Fed. You know, when you talk about affecting monetary policy, in my mind, I'm asking myself, well, how much of the economy does monetary policy affect? And, and can that save, can that make a difference in 10% of the economy, 50% of the economy? And, and so I'm just relating that to the Fed's role in this recent crisis and how that may change your view in the future. So I'm basically just asking for a reflection on this past crisis, which I hope we never see again, ever. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously I share that perspective. Um, and uh, so let me, let me talk a little bit about the crisis. And... You know, I, I've talked about this in earlier speeches. So that I think that what, what the uh, you start to see land prices start to appreciate surprisingly rapidly in the United States at a very early date, uh, beginning in actually 1996. So from 1996 to 2001, residential land prices in the U.S. grew at 11 percent per year. The preceding 25 years, it had grown about 2 percent a year. So you already start to see a relatively fast appreciation. This is you know, monetary policy actually was relatively tight during this period, um, relatively high interest rate. So you start to see that appreciation in the land prices. And that, I think, is the start of uh, and the initiation point for a, a lot of things. People began to have confidence that, boy, land is going to keep growing. There's not a lot of risk in land, especially if we diversify it. You know, there might be risk in California. There might be risk in Minnesota. But if we can put all these pieces together in a one big security, you know, the mortgage-backed securities, there won't be any risk because land prices have never fallen at the same time in, in, across all these locations in the in the in the uh, in, in the economy. And so I think that that expectation drove a lot of the behavior. I think that that in terms of the 
the role of Fed, my, my own view is that the role of monetary policy in this process, as I described, you know, things started much earlier than the uh, relatively easier monetary policy took place in the early 2000s. Um, I think the role of monetary policy has been largely overstated by some observers in this regard. I do think supervision um, and regulation was important. I think that there is, but you have to recognize, and what we all have to recognize, is supervisors and regulators are not independent from the, the overall economy. So that is, if we have politicians, and we have um, banks, we have the public wanting to get in on what appears to be uh, a very good deal, appreciating land prices without any risk, it's, you're going to have, you're going to want to set up a system where regulators and supervisors can stand strong against that. And it is hard to do that. Um, I think that the, uh, why is it hard to do that? Well, there's a great book, which I encourage everyone to, to, to read, called This Time It's Different, which is by Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff. And what they mean by that is these kinds of episodes have occurred periodically throughout world history over the last, I mean, more, peri more often than the word periodically might even suggest, over a very long uh, uh, course of history. And what happens during the course of these episodes, land prices go up, people, there's a lot of easy money floating around, and people say, there's a, the naysayers that say, oh, land can't keep going up like this, or housing can't keep up going up like this, and you'll hear it this time it's different. And what you have to be able to do is somehow ensure you set up a regulatory structure and a supervisory structure that is, is, ensures that, that, the, they, that they can, that the supervisors and regulators can st stand strong against that mentality. Um, I will say, and it's a, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has been sort of calling out the alarm bells about the incentives in the system to take on too much risk for a long time. So my head of supervision, Ron Feldman, and my predecessor, Gary Stern, co-authored a book back in 2004. It was called, was called Too Big to Fail. It didn't get made into an HBO movie, but uh, it was still, it was called Too Big to Fail. And that, that book was pointing out, boy, there's all these incentives in the system to take on risk that because um, people, the, the, the lenders to these financial institutions anticipate that there is some probability that they will be rescued in a time of crisis. And that creates incentives then for um, those institutions to take on more risk than they should. So that too big to fail problem, that stands at the heart of the Dodd-Frank legislation. I think we have to, and we're thinking about this, working on uh, this throughout the system, is making sure we implement those regulations to, to ensure that that too big to fail problem is, is, uh, is, is, I mean, ameliorated, I think is the best word. So I think a lot of good steps have been taken, but the big fight you have is not really with any particular action that takes place. It's more of a mentality that takes over the whole economy, the political economy, and it's this, this time it's different in mentality. And can you set up systems ahead of time to make sure that it doesn't take over the whole, uh, the, the whole political scene and the whole economic scene? That's our challenge. With the uh, growing federal debt and, and the deficit, can you explain your the views on what that may have to do on monetary policy, if any? Yeah, I, I think it's really critical for us if we're for us to be able to maintain our target of two percent or a little under. It's critical for the U.S. to get into a viable debt and deficit position, and. Uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve System has spoken very strongly about this. You know, it's not my place, not his place, not our place to talk about how that happens. That's up to the voters and uh, the elected representatives of the people to settle whether that we get into that position by t uh, increasing taxes or cutting spending. You know, that's not our, uh, you know, maybe we get lucky there's enough growth to get it, to get to help fill the gap. But it is critical for us when Congress issues debt, that's a promise to dollars. And those dollars have to come from somewhere. And, and so that, that impinges on our ability to carry out our task. So I'm not talking about, the, it's not something that is a problem in the you know, next year, or two years. But over the longer haul, we have to have systems in place that will get our debt and deficit back into a viable position. And that, otherwise, it will conflict with our ability to carry out our, our price stability mandate.
Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you could speak at all to uh, the possibility of contagion effects from Europe and how that might affect Fed policy. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think the direct linkages from Europe are uh, relatively small. And so the direct linkages from what's happening in Europe to what's happening in the U.S. should not be that pronounced. With that said, uh, last year during the, the uh, peak of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, well, the initial peak, I guess, would we'll call it, in May of, May of 2010, um, measures of, of volatility in our financial markets spiked uh, to, to high levels. Um, there's a measure called VIX, which is a, stands for Volatility Index, which is essentially uh, a, an asset which is traded against measures of volatility on the S&P 500. During the heat of the financial crisis in, in uh, late 2008, that got up to 80. Right now it's around 18, at the beginning of today at least. Uh, in in, in uh, May of 2010, it got up to 45. So that was a sign of, and what that's coming from is just, I think, just uncertainty and fear, and that can be a drag on the recovery. What can the Fed do about that? I think it can, and I think what was very helpful last year is that we do have tools available. We are not, just because we're keeping the Fed funds rate at zero does not mean that we do not have tools to be supportive to the U.S. economy. That's about the, you know, that's what we have to offer as monetary policymakers to people who are worried about un un uncertainty. And, and we can say, as I just articulated, that I do think the direct linkages from Europe are, are uh, from Europe, both financial and from trade, the trade point of view, are relatively small. It's more just sort of fear point of view that you have to worry about. And all I can do is sort of talk about that. Hi, my name is Max Sullivan. I'm a realtor and I'm also on Social Security. When I take my paycheck every month, which hasn't changed for two years now, I take part of that, put it in my left pocket, which is I use for gas and food. I take the other part of the paycheck, put it in my right pocket, which is what I pay for housing or core inflationary projects. And I've noticed that my left pocket is getting rather empty, and I have to take more money and put it in my left pocket than my right. Please explain to me how, even though I'm taking more, pocket, more money out of my left pocket, that that's not inflationary. So I, I think it's a great question, and it's a question we face all the time. So let me let me talk about that. It is absolutely inflationary. So I will say that right up front. The issue is that our trying to tighten monetary policy right now to control that inflation would be counterproductive. And why is that? That inflation is we do not our our policies operate with these long and variable lags that I talked about. So we would be trying to tighten now. It wouldn't be having an effect for a year or two. Um, I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but over a, a longer period of time. Why is inflation high right now? It's because energy prices went up by 20% over the past year. We should only be thinking about that in terms of inflationary pressures over the horizon in which our policies can operate if we think energy prices are going to keep going up by 20% per year. And I don't, I mean, there's no, no evidence, no information to indicate that that would be true. If energy prices flatten at their current levels, that is not going to be inflationary because they have to keep going up to generate increases in prices. With that said, what the issue really for the high energy prices right now, what I worry about is you're taking the money out of your, I uh, forgot which pocket is which, but you're taking it out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket. That means you have less money to spend in your, out of your right pocket, and that's challenging for the recovery. So it's more of these high energy prices. If they stabilize at these high levels, that's another drag, another headwind that I that I should add to my list. And but that's you know that's due to due to demand supply conditions in those markets. We've got um, situation in the Middle East which is unstable. That leads to higher oil prices. We've got demand from uh, emerging market economies for for oil and energy that leads to higher energy prices. So it's. It's not a monetary policy issue, except insofar it might soften uh, economic performance over the course of, of 2011. It's, it's not, it is inflation, but it doesn't represent inflationary pressures that we should be experiencing over the next two to three years. That's, that's the, the distinction I'm trying to draw. 
Thank you. I appreciate all the questions. Thanks.